We are joined by Dr. Emmanuel Akwete, who is Executive Director of the Institute of Democratic Governance, IDEC, and Professor Bafu Ajmandia, a former UN Senior Governance Advisor. Uh, good morning, Doc. Good morning, Prof. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Good morning. Great. So let me start off with you, Professor Bafu Ajmandia, and I'm sure you've been listening to the suggestions they need to cap ministers at 25, were well, members of parliament not more than 277. They say we don't need deputy ministers, no regional ministers, president should be paying taxes. But for many people, the most important ones, 25 ministers, no deputies, no regional ministers, uh, members of parliament not more than 277. What's your take, Professor Bafu Well, thank you. Um I think we have to put these proposals in a context. We've had our fourth republic almost 30 years now. Uh, we have had some experience that are teaching us perhaps a better way of doing things with our democracy. Uh, secondly, we have an economy that for the past 32 years uh, has not really yielded any serious results for it. Mm. Happy. Our economy is uh, almost bankrupt. Government comes, government goes, and we don't see much improvement. So the combination of the poor way we manage our economy plus the uh, political system that seems not to be able to resolve are leading to this cry for constitutional review. And I think this cry started not today. It's been going on for many years now. But I think we have reached a point where we have to take it serious if we want a new path for our country. Mm. The idea of uh, cutting down the ministers is not a bad one. It's been proposed many times by many institutions and many individuals. The Constitution prescribes a specific, a specific number but gives room for presidents to create as much as they want. And that's why the idea of capping it is, is important in view of the chaos economy that we have and the recklessness with which uh, governments of this republic have managed our resources. It is true, if you look at comparable countries, the number that we have, at times it goes all the way to 120-something, mm. then it comes to about 86, and uh, never been to 60. So I think, first of all, the idea of changing the nomenclature for regional heads of government called regional ministers is an important one. Now we have 16 regions. And even to call them ministers is an anomaly. Ministers preside over ministries, not over regions. But of course, we can debate this. Mm. But in our system, when we have ministers heading ministries, it becomes an anomaly for other set of ministers Head and rigid. So I like the idea of scrapping that title. But we don't leave it vacant. As we have district chief executives, so we can have regional chief executives. That is to say, if we are going to maintain the present system where the executive appoints these people. But I will be, in fact, later on talking about decentralization. That may even nullify these titles we give to people in the districts and maybe we want to give to the regions. So that is a good one. So if currently we reduce it by 16, then we have cut a chunk of the ministers away. The idea of pegging at 25, in my humble opinion, I think 30 is fair because presidents should be given the flexibility of creating ministries in real uh, instances where it is necessary. Mm. In our case, we are have occasions, many occasions, where presidents have gone to bed, looking at them in the morning, and just deciding to create ministries, with all due respect uh, to people who create ministries. But the fact is that if you look at certain ministries, their relevance very contestable. Uh, in the olden days, you have one ministry you can manage the roads, you can manage transportation, you can manage railways and all. But now we have split it into micro-ministries with all the cost that comes with it. So I think our leaders, in a way, have been reckless in creating ministries.
to add to the burden of resourcing them. So cutting them and cutting them is a great idea. I think to 30, okay. what for me will be fair. Okay. With okay. regard to the uh, uh-huh. creating ministers, constituencies, yes, <laughs> this has been a worry all along. Because the constitution says that at a, after every census, we should look at the figures and create and create and create. We have moved, and if we are not careful, in a few more years, we can have 300 plus in parliament. Remember the last time we had to adjust. So we even had to reconstitute the structures in parliament to accommodate. Yes. So again, looking at the cost of maintaining such a huge number for a country such as Ghana, I think it's a wise decision to cut it for a number of years, decades, because uh, uh, it doesn't make sense to create constituencies when, in fact, in a few, a few decades ago, most of these places uh, could be managed by one parliament area. Of course, I do recognize the increase in population and all that, but we have to balance that with the resources, especially in a country that is unproductive. We don't produce, and yet we want to consume all the time. And that has been the problem. So mm. they, maybe in the future, far future, I would say, if we're able to uh, have resources and manage our resources well to yield profit, and some of these considerations may be uh, taken off. So, and, uh, f- these are my preliminary thoughts, but I okay. think it's a wonderful idea, uh, and I think the person chairing this committee has a brilliant mind, so I believe uh, all the other members, and they will come up with ideas that will enable the public, uh, civil society groups to also contribute. And I think they are doing a good job too. Okay, I mean, we'll come back and take your view on uh, you know the constituency you've talked about. But we've, you've talked about it, but uh, I would want you to tell me, for instance, what number they are talking about? Two hundred seventy-seven. There are those that say two hundred or maybe hundred. But I'll get back to you on that. Uh, let me get to Dr. Emmanuel Akwete. Dr. Akwete, you've heard from Professor Bafu Ajbendia. He's talked about maybe capping it at um, you know thirty. He's talked about. Um, if you don't have uh, the need for us to scrap regional ministers, but maybe make it regional chief executive like we have at the district level. What's your own view? Hello, Dr. Akwete. Hello. Yes, Doc, I can hear you. Please go ahead. I, I thought I could get on your live thing on my iPad, but it's not working. Do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, well, First of all, thank you, thank you, and um, I commend the work uh, the committee has done. Um, the first thing I would say is that I thought they should have given us some justification for pruning the number drastically down. Um, if you say we need not more than 30 ministers, um, how is that going to work? Why do we have one to eat something, uh, or something should be brought down to 60-something? And therefore, why would that be the... It is the president who needs people to help uh, him do his work across the country. He's the executive president, he's the head of state, he's the head of government. And in the presidential system, he has control over the whole system. It's not a Westminster type where Hello, Dr. Akwete. Hello, Doc. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. I think we lost you briefly. Yes, I said it's not, it's not a, a cabinet, you know, a prime minister or a Westminster system where you have a prime minister who does the job and then the president. This is an executive president. And so ideas about taking regional ministers, having a cabinet of 25 um, uh, raised questions, and the first thing I want to know is that how did they arrive at this? What is the justification? What is the empirical, the kind of analysis or evidence that shows that in our context this would work? I cannot answer that uh, for them, but what I would say is that um, we, the assumption they are making is that we are going to build, I don't think we have now, a robust an efficient bureaucracy, civil service, local government service, public service institution. And they, that's where we invest the money. They are all over the country. And 
the kind of personnel they have are so competent, qualified, well-trained that, look, they do the job. So having regional ministers or a huge cabinet is superfluous. Okay. They are, they are political leaders, I would say, but the real business of delivering what the president or and his governing party wants to do, the civil service, nonpartisan, proficient, merit-based, is doing that. I've been issue, I would say, we don't have that civil service. Our civil service is totally broken. Uh, I've had a chance of speaking to the president some time ago about this huge number of ministers. In fact, he spoke to civil society organizations, and I happen to be one of them. And he said, well, I don't get what I need from the civil service as swiftly and efficiently as I want it. And I have a limited time to serve. So at that time, I think he was thinking of four terms, service, and he goes. This was his first step. But then he said that I don't have the time, and I need results. So things that get stuck in the civil service would worry me and so on. And in that case, I felt that, well, but some of the people he's appointed do not even, haven't been in the civil service. We don't know their track record. So if you are going to work with, uh, excuse me to say, a dysfunctional civil service, what competence have you to get them to do better or to deliver what they are there for? So. Uh, I think sometimes the way we make decisions and conjure figures and so on is a bit disturbing. I believe that we should have done some research now, a very effective analysis, compar comparative, comparing it with other African countries and so on, and probably come to the conclusion that based on these facts and these uh, systems that we run and other people are needed much more than a huge number of ministers, mm. would it be professional technocrats who would be able to you know yeah, so, uh, so deliver doc, what the government wants to deliver with the yeah, so doc, they, they make that and point. we don't have any of this so i i think i cannot i believe they've done it but yeah, they, didn't they, 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 they make the point doc. but i think they should speak to it i think the number is quite a bit drastic given the state of the civil service today much as i do not believe that the number increased by the president meant that uh, the civil service, they were able to use the existing civil service efficiently. I would still think that there is a problem both ways. The one, two, six, that we got highest, or some say it should be brought to about 60-something, 67, there about, and so on. Fundamentally, it is the civil service, the public services, the local government services, which deliver development. They are professionals of any kind, always constantly trained, and they know what to deliver and show the result within a given time. That is not we, what we have. So if we are going to have 30 ministers, my assumption from the committee is that they propose how the civil service should be reformed. Yeah. At the central level, at the local level, and also the public service institutions, the police, because the civil service acts on the rule of law. And the mandate that says no politician can interfere with the work they are doing, they would have their own institution. If a civil servant is not performing, you go to the Mazian institution, you go to to report. You can't fire him as a minister or in fact, he must be removed. And I know that former or previous heads of uh, the Public Services Commission, when I had conversations with them, I told me the challenges they had when the ministers come in and the deputy, and they want to change the civil servants who are to work with them. And I think the challenge we're having might have started with uh, NDC when they came to power in 2009. And they came with this policy that uh, if for a chief director that they could work with, that chief director must have some affiliation with their party. And it started depleting the system rapidly of the competent people trained. Um, a lot of taxpayers' money goes into the training uh, of these people. Okay. And it was implemented anyway, and the result is what we have seen. So I think I'd like the committee to dig a little bit deeper into this issue so that 
uh, the numbers they are proposing will be well grounded. So they At make the that point, um, Dr. Akute. One minute, I mean, the, the, complexity the committee makes of the that challenge point. Uh, has not been analyzed enough. Empirically, with empirical evidence, learning from other countries, so that we build a very solid uh, system. That okay. is why, for instance, IDEC, we have been talking about uh, reforming the institutions of faith. And we said the technique to reform and build a professional civil service, which we once had under Nkrumah, even under the military NRC, the civil service was no joke in the public services. Now they are something else. Okay. So to rebuild them, it is important then, what would trigger it is to open the system to uh, uh, parties. Say you are going to have parties in local government. If we voted yes, it doesn't mean tomorrow they are in place. It means that this civil service, which has become more or less politically controlled, and people get in who shouldn't get in from exams, whether it's at the top level or the middle or at the bottom, it needs to be fixed first. Because the civil service ought to be neutral, professional, competent, but also neutral to political parties governing. They are institutions of state. And so you come to use them but they are so well trained that they can help you deliver what you have, and you can't deal, you can't play with them. Okay. In the U.S., in the U.K., it's like that. In the U.S., in Germany, and so on. In Ghana, uh, the the politicians even went to the extent of promising what they call neutrality allowance. You see, in local government, close that. And I I had to join that debate and say and tell them that the essence of being a civil servant is your neutrality. You don't look at, in chapter 6 of the Constitution, it's very clear. You should not look at me like a, as a ga or a, a, a man from Kumasia, Santini, or a Northern Line. So, no, my citizenship, even my gender and religion, you cannot stand on. Talk to people and like the experiences they are having all over. So, I think if we are going to cut down on the number of uh, uh, cabinet ministers, then we should also have a very strong or uh, a reformed civil service that really is up to the task and the ministers do not have to do much in terms of the nitty gritties of administration and execution. They are policy makers, they are seen to the present policies being delivered. But we do not have that system and I think it should be built first All to right. look at the numbers. Nonetheless, one twenty six the uh, Oh, see, I just okay, please hold on for me, uh, uh, Dr. Manala Kwete. And the committee makes the point about the fact that we should build a civil service. They've actually argued that technocrats are the ones who are really in charge. And so, based on that, and bearing in mind that deputy ministers are just to assist the ministers, they have no, no clearly defined roles. It will be fine to run the country without deputy ministers, and it will be fine to run the country without regional ministers, and it will be fine to run the country with these ministers and the technocrats who know the job being in charge. When we come back, one of the things I'd want us to explore, since we all seem to have an agreement, for instance, that uh, going for that's something we can do, it will be important to find out some of the ministries we should be thinking about merging or scrapping, but most importantly also about our uh, you know, constituencies. 277? Is that not too much? Yeah. Let's get back to the conversation. We still have uh, Dr. Emmanuel Akwete, who is Executive Director of the Institute of Democratic Governance, uh, IDEG with us, and Professor Bafo Ajimandu, a former UN Senior Governance Advisor. So let me start with you, Professor Bafo Ajimandu. You had suggested maybe we go with uh, regional chief executives. Uh, wouldn't that just be a name change? And the same thing, because then we'd have the same people there, paid for by the states, doing practically the same thing, isn't it? And I thought you were going to call me. And you see, Professor Bafo, I know very well, and he would like yes. me to make a point on yes. the regional ministers. Was it for me? Yes, it's for you, Professor Bafo. I'll, I'll get to you, Dr. Akwiti, to make the same point. <laughs> yes, yes sure right on. But let me go back quickly to a few points uh, made by my good friend, uh, Dr. Akwiti. Yes. Uh, I agree that the civil has been one of the key issues that all governments have to do in terms of their competency, in terms of their loyalty and all. And interesting historically, different governments have reacted differently. 
You may recall Buzia's own attempt to deal with the civil service when he became prime minister. Mm. He used retrenchment, something that became known as Apollo 678. That was his response. Because the civil service, certainly every government has a problem with it. When Kufo became president, his response was to create what we call special assistance to the ministers. He did not simply create ministries. He used a special assistance to provide special uh, support for the ministers without touching the civil servants in that respect. And in fact, I would say that if every president has to respond to the challenges of development, as I think I quoted uh, regarding his meeting with the uh, President Kufu, who suggested that uh, we can't find people who is in a rush to do things. If that was to be the case, and I can tell you, we can have thousand ministers because there are more than thousand challenges that every government should uh, face. Mm. And so if you are going to respond to your challenges by creating ministries, then we can get thousand ministries. So I don't think that's the issue. First, we are concerned about the expenditures that this nation uh, tends to, uh, in view of the very limited resources and the, and the reckless way we manage our resources. So I think when, uh, and, uh, and I, but before I go forward, I also appreciate the fact that the committee is suggesting some kind of reform for the civil service so that it can provide efficient service to support political uh, leaders who come into power. Now, the, the issue of the regional uh, minister. Yes. It's a nomenclature, I agree. But the point is, when there's a difference between a minister in terms of the emolument and the kinds of service that we provide to support the minister and say DC or RC that I'm suggesting. And I think the focus here is the number of ministers that tend to place or necessary effect on our exchequer. So if you redesignate the minister, because until we change the political structure, I suppose there must be somebody heading the region on behalf of the executive. Mm. But of course, if you change the constitution to make the uh, regions uh, or the district uh, leaders elected, then that changes the whole dynamic. So the point is, once we have regions, there must be somebody who represents the executive in the region, whether we call the person a minister or something. Uh, but here, if you call the minister, you are simply overloading this whole thing of ministers that you are trying to reduce. That's, I think that's the important point I made there. Now, uh, uh, in terms of the, 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 the uh, there's another fact I want to put here. We see, we're already forgetting about the human agency that makes ministries and agencies work. Look, if we, we can talk of reforming institutions for decades, and we started this since the beginning of this republic, working at CDD for many years and being in civil society. A lot of money has been spent on seminars and workshops designated as institutional reforms, institutional strengthening, capacity building, and on and on and on. But as we speak, we are still dealing with the same problem that we started dealing with 30 years ago. Okay. Now, I think the problem is not the institution per se. The problem is the human agents, the human beings that are made to run this institution. Look, we do not consider quality of individuals who are appointed. So normally, presidents put a square peg in one hole, and there's no traction when these people take uh, offices. That's mm. important point we need to look at. Okay? Yes. Then also, there has been no consistency in the vision for our national development. I know some years ago, on the NDC, the NDPC attempted to produce a 40-year plan. It was just so, as soon as we got a change in that. So every government town, in a very limited time, like uh, my good friend appreciated, Akufuadi said he, uh, he has limited time to show results, so he gave the 120 ministers. And what results do we have? What results do we have? I appreciate the fact of research and comparative work and all. This work has been done. They exist. We know number of ministers in comparable countries. We know all that. The issue is resolved. 
Okay. Are we getting the right people to manage our institutions? Are presidents not appointing people on the basis of loyalty and not competence? Not uh, people, uh, are we not appointing people who give money for the parties to be successful and not competent? Okay. We don't look at all these things. All that right. is why we keep throwing money away on what we call institutional building, capacity building, and still our capacity, uh, our capacity is it, not there. Right. So I think we need to be serious about looking at those critical issues that are really retarding progress in our country. Finally, if I should say, mm -hmm. all these discussions I believe should take into context the need to decentralize. And here, I'm serious about it. I know my friend, my good friend, Dr. Kweji, has been working uh, like hell on this decentralization issue. But it has to lead to the coupling power. Some of the, I mean, powers that are centered in the executive must be relegated, you can call it devolution, to the local assembly. So that okay. local assemblies can be given the capacity to plan and develop on the basis of their local needs. Right. We do, then of course the national government can supplement this with other huge infrastructure projects like roads and electricity and water, but toilets should not come to the Minister of Sanitation in Accra. All if right, you need a school, it shouldn't be by the Minister of Education in Accra. We have experienced this before. As a young man, we have what you call uh, 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 local council. They were building roads. I went to a middle school called LA Middle School. They were building a school. Why is it today that if you need a school block, uh, somebody in Accra has to have school yeah. These are the issues. Yeah. And the same thing goes with how our national uh, na national resources are managed. We yeah. cannot put all our uh, uh, our resources in the hands of one person called the Minister of Finance, who decides who should fund the construction of a school. Okay? okay, that is another challenge we have. So when we talk of decentralization, we are talking about a power placed between the center and the so-called periphery, the local assembly, so that people can be empowered to begin to determine their own destiny. But not right. one individual in Accra determining the destiny of people at places that they have never been. Thank you that very much, Prof. Let me bring in um, Dr. Akwete at this point, uh, Professor Bafadun. Let me just bring in Dr. Akwete at this point, because he also has a point about uh, the regional ministers. But yes, Dr. Akwete, you, you can go ahead. Listen, I, one of the areas that I didn't comment on, but I just want to be, because what my dear brother had uh, touched on, Sure. Should we abolish regional ministers or not? Tell Ghana me. is a unity state. Yeah. We have an executive president. The, the, the regional minister here is like a governor appointed by the president. I think in the interim, uh, the president needs regional ministers to take care of the regions. And if truly we can reform the local government system, you clearly understand that he needs the regional uh, ministers. They are, they are hitherto, they've just been coordinated. Yes. Probably MMDT is a bit more, more powerful than them, the party apparatchiks and so on. So we need to review that relationship and ask ourselves, what would the regional minister do? If you look at the current system, they are like, they are, they are coordinating <laughs> what is done at the district. They have some security responsibilities in convening the district chief executive. And also, they are appointed. They are not elected. They have no mandate. So that is where sometimes the question arises that couldn't the chief or uh, the regional, yeah, the chief director or whoever has, they call them the regional coordinators or coordinating directors and so on. Are they, are they not good enough to be the ones looking at the delivery of president's policy mm. and um, you know, relaying whatever it is like we are talking for the independent civil service or autonomous civil service. <coughs> this again I think that we should hear from the committee. But where I sit, I think that one person who might be good to talk to about these issues because she's looked at them is Dr. Fabwaji. 
Uh, I know because at one time we started working together on this subject, but she's gone far ahead of that. The regional minister is important if you want the president to move from the old system okay. and not deal directly uh, with the uh, uh, MMDC who, from our proposal, should be elected. Okay, and on okay. party basis. And therefore, that person who represents the president in day-to-day -day running of districts, it's important. The president cannot go directly to every district to handle these things. We, we need to look at it. I don't know how the committee has looked at it, but as you know, the committee on Saturday did not talk about the role parties will play in the reform that we are talking about. But, and I think that's what we talk about. But that's not the time for it now, so I'll keep it. The other... Hello. Um, well, I think we may have uh, just lost, uh, you know, Dr. Kwete. Uh, sorry about that, but that's all time would allow us anyway, I think, point well made. Thank you very much, Dr. Manola Kwete, who's Executive Director of the IDEC, and Professor Bafu Ajmendu, a former UN uh, Senior Governance Advisor.